Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews and happy September. This is our first edition of the show in September 2022. And we couldn't have asked for a better guest to start off the month long series. And that is with the current, one of the current senators from Alberta, Karen Sorensen. Sorry, uh, Senator, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. My pleasure, Chris. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for asking. So I, I know I said I'm going to try to call you Karen during this, but I'm going to get this out of the way by saying, Senator, I've asked every single politician, candidate to be a politician, the exact same question before they get on this show. You're no exception because you are an elected official. You have been an elected official. So I'm going to ask, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, mm -hmm. Senator? Well, that is a good question. And you're right, I have been elected. I started actually as a school board trustee shortly after I had children and uh, then was elected as a town councillor in Banff in 2004, served two terms, uh, then became the mayor of Banff in 2010, served three terms, and now have been uh, given this appointment. And you know, when I'm asked that question, uh, I actually respond with, my desire to serve, I honestly would say came out of love. Uh, love for my children. It was very important to me that I uh, was engaged in the schools they were attending and the education that they were receiving. Certainly love for my community. I think most of your listeners will know where Banff is and what Banff represents. And my heart is here and this town definitely has my complete adoration. And I, I wanted to serve the community. Um, and, you know, now I am a, a very proud Canadian. And uh, I have this amazing opportunity at this point in my life to not only serve our province but to serve to serve the country now before we get into the role of the sounder what you're doing and it now one year since your appointment on july 29th 2021 i want to talk about the person behind the persona and that's you you talk about your love for your community you talked about your love for giving back to your the school system that your kids were going in but the question goes to this, why politics? You could have done many things, whether it be nonprofit, whether it be on the school, uh, like a parent teacher association, but you chose school board trustee, then counselor, then mayor, now sender. What was the desire to get into politics for you? Because that in so many ways is where the decisions are made. And, and certainly I've sat on other boards and yes, boards vote. I actually did after I was a trustee sit on the Banff Elementary School Parent Council for a while and things happen in those meetings and it's important to volunteer in those uh, capacities, absolutely. But I guess I have always wanted to be at the table where the decisions are being made. I, I, I just never intended to sit on the outside watching what was happening. And I, I think I would even, I, I don't know whether it's nature or nurture, but I have always been strongly opinionated and I've always really loved committee work. And uh, I decided I should work on some committees where I actually have a vote in what's going to happen next in any number of topics that you and I could talk about. Was politics discussed at the dinner table for you as the growing up? Because uh, for those who might not know, you're originally from Ontario, like myself in Orangeville, and then you moved, uh, you are now in Banff. So was politics discussed at the dinner table like mine? Or was it something that was hush hush? No, we we weren't a strong, we didn't have strong conversations as a child around politics. I mean, I certainly knew my, my parents politics at that time. So I am a product of you know, coming through a system of, well, I, I guess I should vote this way because, you know, I'm 63 years old. So that can, you can kind of imagine the era that I was in. Um, but certainly as an adult, you start to go, oh, maybe that's not what I think, <laughs> or that's not who I can support at this point in time. But no, we weren't a hugely political family. Uh, I don't really remember ever talking too much about politics with my parents. Although my mother was a volunteer. She would volunteer for, for local candidates at a, both a municipal, or sorry, both at a provincial and a, and a federal um, level. I wanna to turn to your time as a counselor in the town of Banff and also as mayor. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Banff is kind of a unique entity in itself because you are surrounded by a federal national park and there's not much expansion that you can do in the, uh, the town. And if you do, you have to deal with provincial uh, federal regulations and provincial regulations. How hard was it to be a councillor and mayor of a community that is so attached to what goes on federally? 
Yeah, I would not say hard. <laughs> it, it, is a, it, it is an absolute privilege. And we are unique. Banff and Jasper are the only two municipalities located actually in national parks in North America, let alone in Canada. So most national parks have communities nearby, but we are, are in them. Um, so I would say it was a, a privilege uh, to be the mayor of really what is a small town. We have a population of about 9,000 people. However, as I would often say to our other levels of government, we flush toilets for 25,000 people a day on a tax space of 9,000, as we see over 4 million visitors uh, a year here. So, I mean, it certainly created challenges from that perspective. Um, the, our municipality operates provincially like any other municipality would, but you're right, at a federal level, we sit on leased land and I always said the mothership is sitting in, sitting in, in Ottawa. You know, a couple of things I like to point out that makes Banff unique. Uh, first of all, some people might be aware of what we locally call the need to reside clause. Um, you can own a home in Banff, but you can't live in it unless you have a purpose to be here, which is to serve visitors. So if you have a job in the national park, you can live in Banff. If you don't, then you shouldn't be living here. Uh, we're on a set footprint. And so when you talk about things like traffic congestion or building an intercept parking lot or a ring road or anything like that, we can't do that. We're on a set footprint and that will never change in terms of the difference between the town and the park. Um, we also have a commercial cap which means that we only had so many square feet assigned to commercial activity. We are at build out. I, I don't know of any other community that says they are at build out commercially. So you'll see some hotels here currently always renovating and reconstructing, but they have to keep their square footage uh, the same because we are at build out. And the other thing I like to point out, given these opportunities, the fees that you pay as you come into Banff National Park do not come to the municipality. Uh, I don't begrudge those fees. I encourage everybody to pay those fees by your National Park Pass. I'm a huge supporter of Parks Canada, but most people think, oh, well, that money must go to the town. Absolutely not. Uh, we are funded as any other municipality in this province would be. Well, you heard heard it here. So if you're going to complain about those fees, don't call the city, uh, the town of Banff. Call the federal government because they'll take your <laughs> answers. Um, why did you get in? Why why did you run for mayor? For someone who served us two terms, did you have an issue that was burning in the back of your head to say this is how I want to improve the city or or the town? I apologize. Or was it more of a uh, people were calling you saying, "Okay, it's your turn. It's your time to step up." Or what was the reason behind becoming mayor? It's more my need for control. <laughs> a politician who's truthful, Karen. What? Senator, um, sorry, Senator. <laughs> so I had the pleasure of working with Mayor John Stutz for two terms, and uh, I was very aligned with his thinking, and it was a pleasure to serve with him. But when he was partway through his second term, he did let me know he would not uh, be running again. And he said, I really think you should consider um, stepping up at this point. And I, I do like an effective and efficient meeting. I really struggle with people talking to hear themselves talk and getting off topic. And so when I had the, um, I was gonna say power, but I'll say authority <laughs> um, to call the question and to call the debate and to sort of actually manage the meetings, that made me very happy. So it was it was really that. Um, when I did run for mayor in 2010, I was acclaimed, uh, which was fantastic, as I would say to most politicians, isn't that a great way to be elected? I don't know if the public agrees, but, but uh, I was acclaimed in 2010. And then when I ran again in 13, and then in 17, uh, I did have opposition and I definitely knew in 2017, that would be my last term. At that time, I said, I'm going to run once more. Uh, I hope I'm successful, but this will be my last term uh, in this role, not having any idea uh, what my future uh, might hold. So I, I do, I do, as I said, I like committee work. I like sitting at a table with a group of people making decisions. And I guess to be perfectly candid and honest, I like being able to manage what that's going to look like. And in the position of mayor, you're the chair of that committee. Did you enjoy it? Very much. What was very, the highlight? Very, very much. Oh, you know, there's so many, but I think if I had to look at what I really reflect on as something that I was most proud to be involved in, and there was many, but Rome Transit um, coming into Banff, that was a, you know, that John Stutz, actually Mayor John Stutz started that. So we go back to 2010. And, um, 
you know, Banff got on board and then we created transit between Banff and Canmore. We have about a thousand people who live in Canmore and work in Banff every day. And then Canmore came on board and it took us a while longer. Uh, Parks Canada always sat at the table, um, but you know, there was a question of funding and what their role was there. And quick story, it was actually in 2017 when the federal government extended uh, free admission into national parks uh, for uh, that, that celebration. Um, I at that time said to Minister McKenna, Minister McKenna, oh my gosh, like what have you done here? So we had a couple of conversations about the transit system we had in place. We talked about the role that Parks Canada had played to that point. And I said, this is the moment, Minister. And so they did in fact step forward and provide uh, through contracted services transportation into the park that year. But then that is what was the uh, the silver lining of that announcement was Parks Canada is now a full on partner with Trans with Rome Transit out into the park, they have their own equipment, and it truly is what we envision Rome Transit to be, and it's only getting larger and broader and increasing so so that and I was also very proud of a couple of pro housing projects that we did which finally uh, COVID aside pandemic aside our population being reduced aside we did actually get to the point where we had a vacancy rate uh, for rentals. Um, you talked about transportation so I'm going to play in that sandbox for a little bit if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Um, in uh, I'm based in Calgary and there's been a lot of talk over the last year two years about a potential high-speed transit corridor from calgary airport out, out to banff now uh i've never had someone from banff on the show i've never been able to sit down and chat with the former mayor of banff but was there ever a want from this in your community well first of all banff is based on rail you know the whole tourism <laughs> sector in, in banff and banff national park is was birthed uh, because of rail transportation. So of course we have an absolute fondness. And I think I can say confidently, certainly from my perspective, you know, the town and I would think most residents and I think current council support mass transit. You know, mass transit is probably the answer to our traffic challenges um, in, in this community. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm very pleased with what Rome Transit is doing and I'm hoping that, you know, if Calgary is familiar with the Onnit service, that's kind of tied to Rome. And so we're, we're trying to create more mass transit. Um, I think a train coming back into Banff with passengers on it is a wonderful idea. I'm glad I'm not the one who is trying to sort through those challenges. Because there are challenges. Uh, and I appreciate your candor and honesty on that. Uh, uh, while we could talk about your time as mayor and uh, your municipal work uh, in length, I want to turn to the subject matter that is near and dear to your heart now, and that is your role as a senator. On July 29th, 2021, so literally a year ago last month as of recording this, you resigned as mayor of Banff to take on a new uh, job, which would be the sen uh, one of the five senators from the province of Alberta. Um, Let's go through the process of how that came about. Now, you were one of the few uh, that have been selected to uh, sit in the Senate under the new rules that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has put in place. What was that process like? And had you always wanted to sit as a senator? Was this always something that was in the back of your head of saying, I could go sit in the Senate? Seems like a fun job. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say always. Um... I think with, you know, by the time I had decided that I was serving my last term as mayor, uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do after. I knew, even in 2017, I knew that I hadn't reached my best before date and I intended to do something. I didn't know what that would be. Um, I did have a conversation um, with a, a couple of people, honestly, one was um, uh, Lois Mitchell uh, when she was serving as uh, our Lieutenant Governor and um, so, uh, but I had a conversation with a few people and what I, and I had a conversation with Doug Black, who was a previous Senator. And so I was tiptoeing around, what does this look like? How does this work? And so uh, learned that it is in fact an application process and a process that I think is um, a good process. I, I think that lots of benefit has come from reforming the Senate in terms of how it is selected. Uh, so I think it was in the fall of 2019, I applied. And uh, there your application sits, you go online. And if you're over 30 and have 
I think it's currently $4,000 worth of property, um, you can apply to be a senator. And so I put my application in and there it sat. And about a year later, um, I got an email saying that they were going to start looking at senators in Alberta. So just a quick correction. Alberta should have six senators. Six senators. I, yeah. I, I literally said yeah. five and then I was like, I'm pretty sure I just it, lied. It's, it's six, but I understand the confusion. Um, so at that time, Alberta had four senators. And when I was appointed, um, I assumed two more would be appointed. That was not the case. Only I was appointed. So that put us to five. And then very shortly thereafter, Senator Doug Black uh, retired. Uh, he told me it wasn't because I had been appointed. <laughs> Doug and I have a great friendship and I, I enjoy him. So um, we, we're now back down to four senators uh, in Alberta and we should be at six. So not only in Alberta, but across Canada, we the senators are patiently waiting for more appointments, hoping we have 17 vacancies right now, as I understand it, across, across the country. So um, there my application sat and I got an email saying they were going to start looking at, at applications and did I want to pull it? Did I want to update it? What did I want to do? So that's the only communication I had. And then I updated my resume, et cetera, et cetera. And there it sat again. And, uh, you know, again, you just don't ever think <laughs> that this is going to come your way. And I was looking at different options and considering different things that I might do and, uh, you know, preparing for the fact that I would no longer be the mayor of Banff. And, wondering how long I would sit in the fetal position, sucking my thumb, missing my job. But I knew, but I knew the time was right. I knew I had served three terms. I didn't question my decision not to run again. Um, so it was in, as you said, um, June, July timeframe of 21. I, I watched some senators be appointed in uh, Quebec, Ontario and New Brunswick. And I just sort of kept saying, well, I actually said to my husband, oh, I just wish they'd name these Alberta senators so I could you know, forget about it and make a decision. So I got a um, call. We were on van uh, on vacation out on the West Coast, and I saw a six one three number come in on my personal cell phone, and I thought, hmm. So I picked it up, and there was a gentleman on the other end saying that they would like to discuss my application. And so uh, I set up a meeting uh, that very afternoon with two people from the Prime Minister's office. And we had an hour long conversation. I would suggest it was, I think the best term to use is it was vetting. Uh, even, though your res even though your application has a lot of vetting questions in it, uh, I would just say it was more clarity. Um, they were very quick to tell me that this phone call meant nothing and uh, <laughs> that they just were reviewing some resumes. But I was pretty proud of that in that moment. I thought, wow, somebody in Ottawa is holding my resume, my application, uh, which is pretty good. I don't know how many it got picked from. I don't know how many people in Alberta, you know, apply into that pool. And so then they hung up and said, thank you very much. And remember, this means nothing. <laughs> Although they did ask me if I was asked to serve as a senator, what my answer would be. And I was very clear and said that, of course, it would be my honor to serve if selected. So then uh, I think another week passes and I got another phone call saying that they would like to schedule an important follow up call with me. And so we scheduled that. My husband, <laughs> no, I guess that's fine. I say this public. My husband and I were sitting in a parking lot of a brewery in Abbotsford because I just needed signal. Uh, and I had a time that I was expecting this call. And I said to the person who was setting it up, I said, uh, may I ask who I'll be speaking with? And he said, well, you can ask, but we're pretty light on the details over here. So um, I wasn't sure who the call was coming from, but I was thinking maybe. Uh, so my phone rang and what happens is you get the switchboard operator for the prime minister's office. And she said, uh, the prime minister would like to speak with you. And then she connects it. And I said, good evening, prime minister. And uh, he said, hey, Karen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had met a few times. I think he was familiar with who I was. Uh, he certainly has a soft part, soft part for the Cana soft spot for the Canadian Rockies. Um, and as I said, we had met a few times under different circumstances. So um, that was nice that he was familiar enough to to uh, call me by name. And he asked if I would sit uh, on the Canadian Senate representing Alberta. And I told him it would be my absolute privilege to do so. 
Did you, because you resigned the day the announcement came out on July 29th. Was that a plan? Was that a, no matter what, oh. I'm resigning, it's going to no, look no, bad, no. but no, it's no, going to no, have no, to no. happen. So according to the Municipal Government Act, yeah. uh, I needed to resign. It's very clear in the Municipal Government Act. It actually says Senate. If you are appointed as a judge or et cetera, you, you need to step down from your uh, role. So the people I was talking to in Ottawa, um, I, I will say, and I think the Prime Minister hopefully agrees that this was funny just as we were hanging up we talked about 15 minutes and just as I was hanging up I said Prime Minister I said when you hang up will somebody that knows more than you call me back and tell me what <laughs> <laughs> and call me and tell me what I should do next and he laughed and he said yeah great questions for sure he said your phone will ring in about 15 minutes and so uh, that was a, a funny moment for sure anyway I get a call and of course they're very clear that you can't tell anybody so this was on the 20 third of july wow so that was so that I, quick a turnaround I, yeah it and i think i was blessed with that i think some people have way longer turnaround to keep it quiet um so they said you know you can't tell anybody we this needs to be a public announcement i was allowed to tell my 92 year old mother and uh, <laughs> um and my children um so I'm trying. So you, have to, you, so you have to go back to your your right, uh, right. your, so your council and act like everything's normal. You're right. Just, you're but not I resigning, said, but you're slowly packing up your office desk. Yeah, because Yeah. I said to this person, I said, look, I have got to tell the CAO and the deputy mayor. I cannot just allow this to come out publicly and go, sorry, guys, I'm out. And so uh, the question was, how long can you wait? The suggestion was the announcement was going to be that following Thursday. And I said, I can wait till Tuesday. And we established that I did need to resign as well. Yeah. So it was very, um, it was very interesting. I let the CAO know, I wrote a letter of resignation. I carried it around with me because I said, I, you can't open this because the minute you open it, you have to accept it. And I wasn't going to resign until the announcement was public. And then um, curiously enough, the deputy mayor at that time was uh, the current mayor, Corey DeMano, who's a fantastic human being. And uh, she was first elected when she was 26. So she's a very young, progressive female uh, mayor. And uh, I had been on vacation. So I brought her in to tell her. And um, there's probably words in that conversation that I can't say because <laughs> she was thrilled for me, also a bit shocked. And I said, I, I've got to step down. And she said, when? And I said, tomorrow. <laughs> so there was some more conversation and explicitives. And um, she, so just so people understand, so she, because she was a deputy and I had resigned, she became the mayor, but internally on council, they then had to elect among the seven of them. And she continued to be the new mayor for the yeah. end of the term, didn't even think she was running again and then decided to run and run for mayor and, and was successful. So I was able to tell them, and the way that played out, uh, I, the announcement was gonna happen on the Thursday, by now it's Wednesday, I have my letter of resignation in my pocket, the CAO and I are at a really fantastic event with our, um, with the indigenous neighbors from Stony Nation. I, I had a really great experience my last day as mayor. I was at an event, I was taken into the TP, we were smudging, we were in, I, in my head, I'm thinking, what a way to leave this job, even though nobody knew that that's what was happening. Uh, so uh, I got a text on Wednesday. Um, and it was uh, this contact I had in Ottawa saying the Governor General has just signed your documentations. Congratulations, you're a Senator. And so I handed uh, Kelly, our CAO, my letter. And uh, the here you are was... now. <laughs> and then the announcement came less than about you know less than twenty four hours later, and then the town was ready with a press release and et cetera, et cetera. So you do have to be very cautious, but you know there was understanding that were certain things I had to do before it was actually public, but very within twenty four hours or twelve hours of it being public. Um, you you get appointed at a time when. COVID-19 is ravaging. You aren't able to truly take in the whole idea of what the Senate transition is like, because normally you would be able to go to Ottawa, get the boots on the ground. But with everything going on in the world, uh, you were sort of in this weird spot. You're able to travel, but you have to do it safely. Uh, you can't meet in person with potentially other people in Ottawa. How was that transition? It must have been a little bit uh, 
challenging for you? And were you able to rely on some of your fellow Alberta senators for some advice on how this transition is supposed to look like compared to how you got transitioned into the new role of a senator? Yeah, I was always in close contact with Paula uh, Simons and, of course, have since, you know, developed relationships with Patty and Scott. Uh, but actually, Paula was one of the calls I made as well when I had first applied to find out even what the process uh, looked like. So um, and anyway, she sponsored me when I got sworn in. So we, we have developed quite a strong relationship. Um, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, just on the COVID side. And, and, and I will choke up. There was nothing more difficult than being the mayor of Banff. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'll, there was many things more difficult than being the mayor of Banff during COVID. And, you know, let me give a nod to our healthcare workers and numerous other people. Um, but that role of telling people to stay away from this community uh, when it is your only economy was, yeah, I mean, the industry was devastated and just being in a destination where it's our only economy, it was, it was really, really very difficult time. So yeah, there was, there was lots, there'd been a lot of emotion for the, you know, for, I guess, two, well, what were we at then on a year and a half into it or whatever. Yeah. Um, I actually consider not so much COVID a blessing, but the timing was a real blessing for my appointment. First of all, um, the house and the chamber were on uh, their summer break, which means everybody's not in Ottawa. They're working at home in their home provinces and territories. So first of all, I had that time. And then the prime minister was calling an election and you don't sit during an election. So COVID aside, I actually had this great gift now talking to so many other senators of time to get my feet under me and go wait what's happening here so a lot of it i did do from home uh, i hired uh, my staff uh, via zoom i picked my office via zoom but by september uh, my husband and i flew out to ottawa did some paperwork did a few things that we had to do saw my office met <laughs> met my staff face to face and then we weren't called back till november which is when i was I was sworn in. As far as then meetings go, by then we were hybrid, so you could do, um, you could be there or you could uh, sit at home, which again, I think for me from a transition perspective was really helpful, right? You're getting used to flying back and forth on a Monday to a Friday or Thursday. Um, and when there were circumstances that made it difficult for me to get there, i.e. my husband had a knee replacement and I needed to take on the role of nurse, um, which I'm not very good at. Um, you know, I was able to still attend meetings. Uh, so it's been an interesting transition for me. And I don't still know what it's like. I don't know what it's like to be in committee and have witnesses there face to face. I don't know what it's like to be in the chamber without a mask on. I, I you know, so there is lots that is still to come. Uh, and we'll see what happens moving forward with the concept of hybrid meetings, not because of COVID, but you know, because I'm just not sure we should be throwing all this technology right out the window. I want to. I've, I've had the pleasure to ask people who've walked on the uh, the floor of the House of Commons, the uh, at their local city halls, but I, I've had the opportunity to ask only a very few select people who've ever had the opportunity to walk on the floor of the Senate, and you're one of them. Um, now, the Senate is usually the body of government that most people overlook. They don't really know what it's about, but they know it's there. They think it's some stuffy room where people are smoking cigars and <laughs> something happens, but they're not really sure what that happens. We hear this sober second thought thrown around, but really no one really knows what that is. But I want to ask you from this perspective, you are one of hundreds if thousands of Canadians who have been able to walk on that floor as a sitting senator and make the uh, decisions in a sober second thought. Before we talk about sober second thought, I want to ask, what was it like to walk on that floor the very first time as a incoming senator and get sworn in in that red chamber? Yeah, I see. I'm going to choke up again. It was very emotional. Yeah, it was uh, the whole thing. The whole thing was so overwhelming and I, you know, I, I, I guess the word grateful is really what's popping into my mind. I, you know, I, I, I look at my previous careers in hospitality and I had my own business and then I had this, the greatest privilege of what I thought was going to be the greatest privilege of my life uh, to be the mayor of Banff and then to be given, you know, at, I'm 63, so 62 years of age, uh, a fourth career um to 
learn more and to serve in a completely different capacity than I could have ever imagined. I mean, I thought about MP, I thought about MLA, but I never really thought about this. And to your point, because maybe I didn't also know very much about what the Senate uh, does. So it was very emotional. Certainly we walked in and I was very teary. Um, and, you know, I had my EA with me and we had um, one of the senior pages walking us through and doing a whole tour of, of the building. And, but walking on that uh, into that red chamber is, is, is something for sure. You have now gotten almost a year under your belt as a senator. You were sworn in November, but really let's call it a year because you were appointed on Jill, uh, July 29th. Um, has it been a learning curve? Oh, has it, has, what, what's the, been the biggest learning curve that you've been able to overcome or that you didn't expect that you'd have to overcome? It's a huge learning curve. There, there, there is nothing like it uh, in in my life, regardless of what other jobs I've had had previously. Um, I think the biggest learning curve is is process and and how not what the Senate does. I, I picked up on that pretty quickly, um, but how the Senate does it. And it's it's certainly very different than I understand any, certainly municipal and, and any other uh, level of government. And um, the Senate, again, not to really get into the weeds, but the Senate is set up, there's four groups in the Senate and you choose your group. I'm an independent Senator. And, and while the Senate in, and I'll, in, in my world, thankfully is a nonpartisan uh, entity now. Um, we do still have uh, a few senators who identify clearly as conservative and as opposition. So I, I didn't know that was coming. I'm like, wait, wait, I, I thought we were, you know, nonpartisan, but you know, they serve the role they serve. Um, I had to pick a group. I had to try and understand what the different groups were and why there was groups. And then I remember that at the same time I was appointed, there was a pre the uh, Bernadette Clement, who is from Cornwall, Ontario. She'd been the mayor of, Can uh, of Cornwall. And we were appointed at the same time. And admittedly, <laughs> we'd be these first few days sitting, trying to figure out what's happening. Like, what are they doing? What, who's talking? Why are, where are the notes? Like, how do, where's the agenda? And she and I would, I'd be texting going, what do you think's happening now? And she like, <laughs> then we'd meet after him like, why did that person get up and talk for 45 minutes and and the other person could only talk for 10 minutes so it, it there's a lot of process um that i would say i'm still um trying to understand and to your point on the hybrid meetings and the covid situation it kind of added to that bit of confusion um and uh yeah and and you're right i hadn't met all i, I still probably haven't met all the senators because people were sitting at different places so it's a huge huge learning curve but hey nothing better than learning when you're you know we talk about the role of the senate and being the sober second thought and in my opinion that is uh the house of commons passes a bill they send it for this uh, the senate to review edit update make better just in case the house of commons in their partisan mindset is forgetting something as a former municipal uh politician now a senator, does that give you a little bit of a different perspective looking at some of the bills that you've seen come across your desk from the House of Commons ago? Like from a municipal perspective, this doesn't make sense compared to how the House of Commons is looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, just the way a council meeting operates is very, very different than the way this this operates. And I think maybe the clearest way to put it, I was told, and I believe this to be true, by the time a piece of legislation gets royal assent, meaning it has come through the House and the Senate and potentially back to the House, it's a three to five year process. I mean, legalizing cannabis was a big deal. You know, um, you know, the the bill on uh, the right to, to die made. Um, made. Thank you. I was trying to think of the word. Um, those are big, big decisions with a lot of opinions. Uh, whereas in council, you know, you're, you, you, something might take a few meetings or a few months, especially in a small town, maybe in cities where there's 13 or 15 or in Toronto where there's so many councillors. But so, so the timing, um, you know, I, 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 as I said much earlier, I struggle with inefficiency and I'm not suggesting the Senate is inefficient. It's, it's efficient in the way it has to operate, but it's not as quick as, as what I was used to. But you're right. I mean, I, I think you described it 
very well. Uh, I try not to use this term lightly because I don't want to minimize the role, but even the way you described it, it's a bit like a focus group. It's yeah. like, he, here's what we think. They hand it off to 105 uh, everyday Canadians who have managed to find themselves in the role of Senate. And they're like, exactly what you said. Did, how, are we good? Did we miss something? Is there something we didn't think of? Now, a bill uh, does come from the House to the Senate. The Senate then takes it to committee and they review it and then they bring it back to the Senate and then they pass it and then they send it back to the House. It can go the other way as well. Yeah. It's not as often, but a Senate, the Senate can also introduce a bill and then it goes to the House and we back and forth. And then finally, the Governor General signs off on it when both organizations, for lack of a better term, have uh, approved it. And then it receives royal assent and becomes law. You are on two of which I would consider the most busiest committees that I've ever seen in the, especially the last few months, but it coming into the next uh, sitting of the uh, Senate. And that is the Transportation and Communications Committee and the Energy and the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Now, um, I wanna talk about energy for a few seconds, but I wanna start with the uh, Transportation uh, Communications because there's been a lot of talk about B uh, C11, which is the, uh, 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 sorry, the- Broadca sense Broadcasting. Broadcasting bill. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing I could find the word, but yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you, yeah. you couldn't think of yeah. made. I can't think of broadcast. It's yeah, good. it's the updating of the broadcasting bill. Yes. Um, you're this 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 is going to be on top of your agenda probably when you get back into Ottawa. If not, it's already still going on. Uh, <laughs> what's your thoughts on the current iteration of this bill? Well, I'll just backtrack a little bit and say those two committees. I guess I was a keener. I wasn't really <laughs> sure. And I was, when I told my group, the ISG, that these were my first two choices, I was so shocked when I got them. And then I'm like, oh, maybe nobody else, want, maybe nobody else wanted these. <laughs> Why didn't they want them? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But no, I'm very pleased to serve on both of those. And just quickly, too, because I think this is so interesting. Why would transportation and communication be one committee? Well, it dates back to rail travel and the Morse code. Oh, yeah, so so transportation and communication were very connected in our history. And so they've never divided those two uh, committees out. So you're right, I can be talking about um, the shortage of mariners we have to operate ferries one day and be talking about this huge broadcasting bill uh, the next. But this, you're right, this is the legislation that is before um, the Transportation and Communications Committee at the Senate currently. It has passed through the House, so it has been handed, just as we were talking about, over to the Senate, and now the Senate Committee will look at it, uh, hear witnesses, hear information, uh, potentially amend uh, what the House has already settled on and amended, and then we send it back back over to them. Now, the Senate has to pass it three times, three readings, and then we send it send it back to them. Whether the House accepts the Senate's amendments or not, that's all. I'm still trying to figure that piece out. This will be an interesting one to watch. Yeah. Um, so in terms of this bill, what was the question? <laughs> what, do, you, what's, do you have an opinion on it right now? Because I know you've probably read it because like you said, it's been given to the committee. So you've had to review it at least once now. Yep. There is concern across, well, there is concern that it is uh, overstepping potentially for some social media users. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get partisan, but there are some candidates who are saying that it is censoring free speech in this uh, country. Uh, as a senator who is going to be looking at this, uh, what's your opinion? I, and I'm not trying to put you on on the spot here senator no. but it's just it, there's a lot of people who are talking about it and while it's not a topic of conversation in most of my circles that i talk to it is something that people are wondering what's going to happen so let's get that out of the way this is not not censorship of free speech and some of the ideas that come out of you know i just did s5 which is the right to a healthy environment and it's, I don't know. I, I mean, that's another whole conversation, right, about how, how what, what's happening in our society and why are untruths being spread. And, you know, I can't even tell you the number of emails I get about censoring people. That is not what this is about. And I do encourage people, you know, Paula Simons is an expert on this. She, she has been working on this bill really since she became a senator. And there was C-10 before there was C-11. And she was involved in that. And she's a, the one of the um, uh, leaders on this bill. So anyway, 
Go listen to Paula talk about the fact that it's well. Hopefully, for- Paula will come on after oh. she sees that you're on. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, no. I reached out to her, so let's see. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, well, she she would be a very good person to talk about um, C11 for sure. Um, so I'm I'm learning a few things. Um, there seems to be concerns around yes. Uh, user content who is a user so if uh, so and so happens to have 150,000 followers on YouTube and produces their own um, uh, content are they going to be impacted by this the answer as I understand it is no but the way the revision has come out in the bill seems to leave a door open so now it's making people nervous I I choose to believe that that is not the intent Um, the real intent of this bill is to, first of all, this bill hasn't been looked at in 30 years. And one thing that we didn't have 30 years ago was the internet. So- Or so cell phones or Twitter. Streaming <laughs> services. So this is really about looking at streaming services and online content and bringing it into the bill and trying to set appropriate regulations as we have for broadcasting, which is television stations and radio stations. Um, to try and bring the internet into that because the internet has broadcasting opportunities. Uh, and from a Netflix to a Disney Plus to YouTube to TikTok to whatever. So that's what it's attempting to do. It's also attempting to really uh, lift Canadian content up and also to make sure that we within that Canadian content are recognizing um, <laughs> Our, our Indigenous people, our, both our French and English languages uh, for, um, uh, well, all diverse members of our Canadian population. And, and you know, how that looks and how they word it is, is interesting. Um, and then the other really thing that I'm finding in the meetings, I've had this word discoverability. And it's if you are using the internet because of algorithms and if you look at Canadian content and or you don't want Canadian content and who's controlling the algorithms and I think that's the other piece are, are we trying to control what people can see and watch no that's not the intent of it you know with some of these conversations it's like do you think the parliamentarians sit behind a closed door going hmm I wonder how we can restrict people from doing something that somehow we don't want them to do. So for those uh, like those two people who probably do watch this show, who think that way, that there are people (laughs) sitting behind this, there isn't. And I'm sorry. And that's where this show comes from. There aren't people sitting in some seedy little back room, smoking a cigar with an agenda. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Right. Um, So anyway, it's a very interesting bill and I am learning about it. I've had some fascinating meetings. I I have met with the, just met with the Canadian broadcast. Broadcasting Association. I've met with YouTube Canada. I'm meeting with TikTok tomorrow. Um, you know, Disney. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, conversations on this, and uh, we will be. We've actually been called back a week early uh, in order to start sitting in committee on this one. So we we'll start our witnesses and and uh, looking at the bill on September 14th, as far as oh. I know. Um, the last group I want, the last committee I want to talk about just uh, quickly and not quickly, but there's uh, probably a few questions I have. Um, and that's the energy, the environment and natural resources. Um, Mayor of Banff, who sits in the uh, National Park, you are an Albertan. This seems like the committee that is destined to have you on that committee. Um, what's the big issues that are facing that committee right now? Well, you know, the, we, we, that was my first piece of legislation that I looked at. And interesting enough, that was one that started in the Senate, uh, which was the, it's part, was part of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and it's S5, which is the right to a healthy environment. And we looked at that, that committee had to look at that clause by clause and try and understand even what those words mean. And it was very much more related to people, people saw we were opening up SEPA and, and, you know, we were getting feedback on all kinds of topics, but we had to kind of keep it to that. And it really had to do with toxicity and chemicals. So, in one breath, I'm meeting with uh, EcoJustice and the Canadian Environmental Law Association and, um, uh, you know, NGOs, uh, Davis Suzuki Foundation. And then in the next meeting, I've got the Chemical Association of Canada and the Cosmetic Association of Canada. And so you get, again, lots of feedback. And by no means are those organizations at loggerheads. There, There usually is some well, this is good, but we don't think this is good and this and this and this. So we did get S5 through and we have sent that now back to the house. Um, so that really has been top of mind. I, I guess, you know, we were in the middle of doing a study when we got that legislation on how uh, climate change 
No, that's the transportation one is affecting transportation modes. Um, isn't that awful? I can't even remember exactly what study we were trying to, we were starting, but the legislation hit very quickly. And so we will go back. So we, we often look at legislation, but the other thing the committees do is studies on something that interests them. Um, you, uh, as an Albertan, um, it is hard to not talk about energy and natural resources and pipelines uh, without talking about Alberta and a senator from Alberta. Um, you may have your opinions on certain issues, whether you want a pipeline or don't want a pipeline, but you are representing Alberta as a whole. How do you represent the people of Alberta while tr trying to still stay true to who you are and what you believe in? Because sometimes, and I've asked this to politicians in the House of Commons, sometimes you will have to vote for something that doesn't really sit well with you because it's in the best interest of Canada, but also in the best interest of Alberta. How does that work for a senator? Because you have to, you're playing a balancing act as well, because you have to look at the bigger picture, but you also have to look at as a provincial issue as well, because you are there to represent the people of Alberta. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let me start by saying I do consider myself a person who is very concerned around environmental topics such as uh, climate change. Uh, I, I sit on a working group, which is a different entity that, you know, Senators for Climate Action. Um, I live in a national park um, and, you know, I'm watching what is happening to our world from an environmental perspective. But I think the most important piece on any of these committees is educate yourself. And I honestly, am now in the process of learning as much as I possibly can and meeting with as many people as I possibly can uh, in the oil industry. I've never been to the oil sands. I'm, I'm working on a trip uh, to the oil sands so that I can actually observe and meet. I have a, you know, just actually had a, a meeting uh, today with one of our prominent uh, oil companies and I have another meeting set up next week. So I am doing the best I can to educate myself. Um, what I do know is that the oil industry is working very, very, very hard to transition. And have, as I understand it, been working on some solutions for perhaps longer than any other industry. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for the work that the oil industry is doing. And I have a lot of respect for the people and the teams they have put in place to start talking about how we transition and how that works. And whether it's a popular comment or not, we can't just turn the switch off. <laughs> and, and I think most people understand that. We have to start doing something. We have to start moving in the right direction, you know, particularly around um, climate change. And of course, another topic near and dear to my heart is biodiversity. I mean, as the climate changes, it really impacts the species on earth. So I have some really strong views on we need to do better and we need to put, uh, legislation in place to to force these very serious changes that need to be made but we need to do it while consulting with um you know others who play a huge part in that like the oil industry and as i said i i leave every meeting i have with uh one of our uh albertan oil companies uh feeling uh that they understand that they are working to do things better and differently. And um, I'm, I'm impressed with the people I meet in those, in those organizations. So, you know, I'm not, I think you have to be balanced and I think you have to be educated and then you have to form an opinion on whatever the question is. And if it's a question of legislation, well, then I'll need to form an opinion. No, I'm taking this with me. I used to use this at, at town in municipally all the time. You know, when you have to vote on something and you're not exactly sure, <laughs> what way you should go and believe me when you're chairing that's a hard position to be in if you haven't quite decided at the table by the way it's a great thing to not have made up your mind at the table you know most people go in with an opinion of how they're going to vote I was always really happy when I had my mind changed at the table because uh, it meant that somebody said something and I went oh I, it, it told me I was still being open-minded you know oh, I hadn't thought about that so thanks for bringing that up so my filters always were you look at the decision you say okay who does it help and who does it hurt um, what's the cost? And I don't mean just financial. I, I, I spend a lot of time considering cost and value. Oh, this is really expensive. I know, but what's the value of doing it? 
does it outweigh outweigh the costs? Um, and my final question always is, is it the right thing to do? And when I use that filter, I generally know how I'm going to vote. It may not be a popular vote, uh, <laughs> but it, it helps me make those decisions. That final filter is, is, is it the right thing to do? Uh, last topic, and it's a very short topic, but I want to get your statement on here. We have seen the rise of a polarized Canadian population, uh, whether that be through social media, whether that be through things that are going on externally with things, uh, the Freedom Convoy that hit Ottawa earlier this year, but we are seeing a more divided country. Earlier this uh, earlier in August, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, came to Grand Prairie, Alberta, and she was uh, yelled at, she was sworn at, and we are seeing this becoming a staple of what is happening in Canada. Politicians from all backgrounds, from all political parties are getting yelled at, threatened, so on and so forth. Um, I want to get your opinion on the, the polarization in this country. And then also I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask him both at the same time so you can answer both at once. Have you been on the receiving end of some vile threats that we saw that was happening up in Grand Prairie? Or as a senator, are you sort of out of the realm because people may not know who you are? I think we're, I think I'm, I think we're less impacted than than electeds are for sure, but I certainly get some nasty, uh, nasty correspondence, uh, I, I, which is, by the way, sent to every MP and every senator. So I don't take it all that that personally. Um, you know, the other thing I think it's important to mention, and and I do believe that women are at a higher proportion uh, targeted for this uh, kind of activity. That being said, I, I do want to acknowledge that men too uh, are 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 dealing with these attacks. And I don't think that any male should have to feel that somehow they just have to deal with it because they happen to be a man, you know? So I, I know there's a lot of attention on women and uh, misogyny and bullying. And I think that's a very valid point. And I think it does happen more often to women. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that I also know and see that it happens to everybody. Um, you know, regardless of, of whatever gender you happen to identify by. Um, How do we turn it down, though? How yeah. do we turn down the rhetoric? Because I think that's, as the member of the Committee for Communications, how do we <laughs> do that? You know, I, I, I don't have an answer. I do believe that it is the current digital world that we are in that has caused the escalation. I think whether it's robots sending out messages on social media, whether it's somebody observing somebody behave in a way that just recently happened up in Grand Prairie and thinking, well, if that's okay for them to do it, then it's okay for me to do it. I mean, we can look at our neighbors to the South, <laughs> you know, has that impacted the way that we as Canadians are, are behaving? Um, I, I, I put a tweet out, um, shortly after that happened with our deputy prime minister and um, basically in an effort to just say, I, you know, I stand with you. I, I support you and this shouldn't have happened to you. Um, and the backlash from that, and it wasn't backlash at me. It was more backlash at her. And there was terrible things said and there was terrible pictures posted and it was vile. And so I deleted the post because I couldn't be responsible for her continuing to receive that kind of hate and disgusting messaging. So I took the tweet down because, you know, I, I was, I just, I just couldn't be the person responsible for that coming out, you know, and, and, and you know, funny, like it just stops, it just stops dead. So um, I'm, a, I'm a bit off track. I, I don't know um, exactly what, what I do think is important. And I've heard this um, from a, a few people, um, you know, you look at that situation, we'll just use that as a case study. What's the consequence? If there's no, it's, it's child rearing 101. <laughs> If there's no consequence, then I'm going to continue this behavior. And I don't know at what point there needs to be a consequence. And I don't know what the consequence should be. But if we look at that scenario from last week, and I don't know if there's going to be a consequence. I, I, don't, I don't know who's involved. I don't know who's, 
that with this human so being. ctv came out to the day of this recording and said that there was an investigation going on around the incident that happened in grand prairie but with the deputy prime minister but that's all i could get out of it there was nothing yeah. about what in what what the investigation entitles but there it is how do you like so so uh, is is it legislation is it laws uh, and and i mean again what an what a what a big compact but big big complex topic to have but i do get offended uh when people talk about uh freedom because this type of behavior limits our freedom people are afraid i'm you know i i, I was afraid for her can you imagine she's surrounded by her three female staff what if he'd gone into the elevator? And I'm not saying he would have hurt them physically. He was a big man. And what if he'd gone into the elevator and the doors had shut? Like, like that's scary. And he didn't. And maybe he never intended to. But just watching that horrified me. And I, I don't even know if maybe he or whoever understands that fear and that it does stop people from going into these roles. Absolutely. You know, there's been all kinds of surveys. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so anyway, it's it's a, it is unfortunate. I wish I wish there was I an had, easy answer. I wish there was an easy answer. And and you know, it's a silo and I put and I put at the end of my when I deleted the tweet and then I retweeted out and I made some comments. And at the end I just said for anybody who suggested that our Deputy Prime Minister Freeland deserved that. I just hang my head in sadness and shame of who we've become. I thank you for answering that. And I want to ask you my very last question because it's coming up on the hour mark and I want, I know you are a busy person, so I need to get, I need to let you get back to your senatorial duties here. Um, my last question is this, you are going back to Ottawa or you're going to be going back into sitting here on September 14th with committee. Um, what's on your agenda? what we can talk about committees we yep. can talk about what needs to be done committee wise but what do you want to advocate for in the fall session of the senate well thank you for asking because that is a very cool part of a senator's job yes we have our senate work to do but we can kind of pick where our interests lay and believe me there are you know if we're at top staffing 105 senators incredibly accomplished people with fantastic backgrounds but my thing is lifting tourism up there there isn't another senator i mean every senator is concerned about tourism in their own province and territory etc but there wasn't anybody in the senate that has the background in tourism that i do and there isn't really anybody talking about tourism uh in the senate that's why i went to the transportation and communications committee it was as close as i could get to tourism because we talk about airplanes and things um so um i'm very uh happy to um be lifting that up. I'm spending uh, my work time that isn't focused on actual Senate work, uh, working with Tourism Industry Association of Canada. I work with Human Resources um, uh, Tourism, the Human Resources Tourism Committee, which is also in Ottawa. And um, of course, delighted that the federal government actually has a tourism minister, uh, which is great. And he happens to be from Alberta, <laughs> which is even greater. Um, and he contacted me shortly uh, after we started to start to sit again last November, December, and he has reinstated um, an interparliamentary nonpartisan tourism caucus and asked me to vice chair it. So um, I'm really happy about that. So myself and, and MP uh, Patrick Wheeler from the Sunshine Coast are co-chairs and our, the job of this caucus is to advocate for and lift up uh, tourism as the crucial and important industry that it is you know hashtag tourism matters it certainly does i know uh, i know my husband would be agreeing <laughs> and nodding very heavily at that statement uh, he'll Karen love that Sandin. you give my very best to ricardo of course we worked together in his past life and in my past job and uh he was a delight to work with well, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. I know to sit down with a senator like yourself is an honor for me, but honor for the show to have someone like you take time out of your business schedule to talk about your role, talk about what goes on in the Senate and talk about the day to day is happening because we always forget about the Senate and I want to shine a little bit of a light going forward on what the Senate's actually doing because we often forget. 
Well, thank you very much. Honestly, my pleasure. I, I love the, I think podcasts are just the best. They're just, you know, you don't, you don't really have time to prep. You know, if I'm doing a media interview, I've got notes, I've got suggested questions. I've got, you know, suggested answer. Yeah. I got nothing here. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, um, oh, I appreciate it. Um, well, Senator, thank you so much for uh, this, for all my listeners and my, all my viewers, the links to the Senator's, uh, website but also the link to the i want to get this right the independent senators group website so learn more about who they are and what they do but also uh the senators twitter account is in the show notes so scroll down learn a little bit more because it does help us become a better society when we learn and also for all those people who have just talked about social media i'm going to say this to you directly put your phone down Get out from behind your social media accounts and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps our, us as a people grow and be better. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking. Yeah.